Hello, this is Steve again from Southern Illinois, and uh, it's a beautiful day down here. A little bit cloudy, possibility of rain finally after three weeks, but uh, it's a nice balmy 70 degrees and uh, I and the neighbors are enjoying our yard. So, <clears throat> last week when we ended, I kind of left us on the horns of a dilemma. The Bible says that Jesus experienced all of the temptations that we do, but I have a hard time connecting with that because the temptations that are mentioned in the Bible that Jesus experienced are so unlike mine, at least at face value. Okay. So, but before we go further on that, I want to take you someplace, and that someplace is here in my yard. Welcome to the Garden of Steve. Okay, nothing spectacular, okay? Vivian loves uh, tomatoes, and so tomatoes are primarily what I grow. Uh, this year the zucchini and summer squash actually grew, and uh, <laughs> boy howdy, have we had an avalanche of zucchini. But that's not what I wanted to talk about. You know, my garden's not very big, it's nothing spectacular, but it's a happy place. And I want to tell you a story from the garden. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, I went on strike. And for an entire summer, I refused to weed my garden. Now, some folks would say I still am rather lackadaisical about my weeding. But uh, that summer, I refused to pull a single weed unless I could identify it. And let me tell you, in the days before the World Wide Web opened the doors to the Temple of Knowledge to us, uh, identifying weeds was a real challenge. All I had was one thin field guide with line drawings of weeds, and I spent the entire summer pouring through that book. Now, unfortunately, it identified weeds by the flowering stage. So until a weed could flower, I couldn't identify it, which meant that most of the weeds in my garden uh, had a free pass for the entire summer. All of which goes to say that Steve, in his weirdness, has come into some intimate knowledge of weeds that he would now like to share with you. So let me show you some of my favorite weeds. Now, here, uh, silhouetted against the beautiful zucchini uh, is one of my favorite weeds uh, called pigweed. Now this is uh, red root pigweed. I have studiously dug out all of the spiny pigweed out of the garden and it no longer exists. But pigweed uh, actually grows world this family grows worldwide and is used as a food stuff uh, in many parts of the world but as a weed it has several strategies that allowed it to be weedy one is the profuse seeding you can see here that it's it's producing a lot of seeds and if I let if I don't dig this plant out next year pigweed is going to be growing every place, but I have purposely left this one pigweed to grow so that I could show it to you. And I've been trying to get to this stage in our, our talks uh, for several weeks now, so it's kind of gotten out of hand. Pigweed seeds dramatically, but also if when you weed it and then just lay it on the ground, the roots, uh, it reroots itself and um, then you've got the weed growing all over again. So let me go to another place in the garden here. Okay, this is uh, my herb bed, but there's a couple of other weeds here. So here we have purslane, which uh, is on the menu in some of the gourmet restaurants in New York. In the spring, the leaves are bigger and they're nice and juicy, and they, they're a nice addition to salads, kind of give it a peppery, peppery taste. Uh, 
purslane also seeds prolifically, but the seeds are so tiny and the flowers are so tiny, you don't even need to know, know that it's happening. Purslane also uh, reroots. In fact, if you hoe it, every single bit of the stem that is left behind will reroot and create another plant. If you take a leaf off and lay it on the ground and there's any moisture at all, it will reroot. You have to know your weeds in order to weed them out. And here's another weed, okay? It's not at the flowering stage, but some of you may recognize it. Dandelion. Its strategy, uh, it seeds very early in the season. So right now, I don't have any dandelions growing in my yard. But earlier in the season, we had dandelions all over the place blowing in the wind. But dandelions, you not only have, you can't pull dandelions. Uh, you have to dig them up. If there's, if the root is within an inch of the surface uh, when it breaks off then you get another dandelion growing. And I know this stuff just really is intriguing to you all. <clears throat> Vivian uh, says I am entranced with weeds. Here's another one of my favorites, wood sorrel. This is another good addition to salads. Uh, it's kind of sour and, and gives it a spice. But these seed pods that you can see there uh, when they ripen, they op open with a twisting motion that explosively spreads the seeds around. And unlike dandelions and purslane and, and um, pigweed, wood sorrel <laughs> spreads with stems that crawl along the ground or under the ground. And when you pull it, the stems break off and so you're left behind, what's left behind then continues to grow and you can't, couldn't even see it when you were pulling the weed. So why is Steve talking about weeds? And I'm going to get over here away from my neighbor who's doing the landscaping with his tractor. Uh, why are we talking about weeds? Well, if you don't know your weeds, um, you can't get them out of the garden because what works for one weed doesn't work for all of them. And temptations are very similar. As I've shared with you earlier, um, temptations we usually think of in terms of the urges and desires that we experience. Let me just get some light on the subject here. The urges and desires that we experience, or the objects that are the focus of our desire. But I find that that perspective, uh, number one, is not very helpful in terms of overcoming temptations. Uh, yes, we can fight those urges. Yes, we can try to eliminate the objects of our desire from our life. But the temptations keep coming back. They keep regrowing because they were never gone in the first place. So what about Jesus' temptations? One perspective that I've found helpful is to think of temptations as being connected to the suffering in our lives. What suffering did Jesus go through? And the place that's most visible is in the Passion Week, especially from Gethsemane on. So let's just step through, fast forward, what he experienced. In the garden, he's praying, they're agonizing, asking God to, to not force him to go through with this. And then he's betrayed with a kiss, dragged away by a mob, the church people take him and put him on trial all night. Then they take him over to the civil authorities. He goes through a mock trial several times there. Um, Herod asks, demands that he do a miracle for him. He'll, he'll release him if he'll just do one miracle to prove who he is. But in the end, he gets turned over to the so soldiers who brutalize him. And then he's paraded through the streets 
spitting on him, he's carrying his cross, he's bleeding, he has a crown of thorns on, he's whipped to the point where he's, he's just, his, his, his body is just a, a mass of gashes, and finally he's nailed to a cross. He's lynched, and it goes on for hours. Do you identify with any of that suffering? Can you look at your life and say, yeah, this has happened to me, this has happened to me. Last year we were going through this exercise in church and, and one of my friends just blurted out, no, I've never gone through that, I've never been crucified. Uh, you know, none of these things have happened in my life. And I would, I would say that's probably true for most of us. Okay. But then I went through and um, I, I listed off the meaning behind each one of those experiences. Things like, I'm all alone. I've been abandoned. I've been betrayed. I can't trust anyone. No one's in my corner. Sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental, verbal abuse. Life is hopeless. And as I listed off all of those meanings of those experiences, the interpretations that we put to them, or I might say the lies that challenge our identities, I saw light bulbs going on all, all around the room. People saying, wow, yes, I identify with that. I identify with this. You see, temptations are not so much about our desires or our objects as they are about the needs in our life, the needs that grow out of our suffering and the lies that those that suffering can, can bring that challenges our identity. This perspective has really been powerful in my life. How? You see, Jesus experienced the same things I did. He's felt alone. He's felt betrayed. He has felt like his entire life's work was a failure. He has been taunted for being different. He's been physically abused. He's been sexually abused, mentally, verbally. All of these things, he has gone through it but he refused to accept the lies, that, which is the root of the temptation. And he took every one of those lies with him to the cross. Now, as Christians, we find it very easy to say, Jesus died for my sins, so I have forgiveness. Jesus took my sins upon him and took them to the cross, so I have forgiveness. And in the last year, I learned the perspective of realizing that Jesus also took my suffering to the cross. He refused to give in to it. He refused to give in to the doubt, the, re the anger, the, the rejection of God. He refused to start protecting himself instead of putting his trust in God. He refused to prove his identity or to, to deny it. I am a child of God. That's what the Bible tells me. You are a child of God. And our temptations challenge that identity. They make us wonder if God really has abandoned us. They make us wonder whether God is real. They make us wonder whether we can ever, ever live up to what he wants from us. And friends, we can take that to Jesus too. Earlier I talked about the weight of the cross and what Jesus really carried with him as he walked, struggled to Calvary. And part of that weight was your suffering and mine 
your temptations and mine. And when we claim his victory by faith, it can be just as real in our lives as when we claim forgiveness because of his death. Now, if you're not a Christian, this may sound strange. If you are a Christian, expanding the concept of grace to include not only the guilt of our sins, but our temptations, is a brand new perspective, or at least it was for me. So I invite you to think about this, wrestle with it, see how it applies with your life. Now, next week, okay, our church has not reopened uh, uh, along with the rest of the churches here in Southern Illinois because we are a small group and one family was wrestling with cancer. Um, that cancer surgery is now passed and recovery has occurred. Another family was wrestling with heart disease and lung disease and was very, very fragile they're doing much better. So we have decided next week that we are going to reopen. Um, but we're going to do it differently. Uh, we are going to have church in the backyard, in the backyard of our church. And we're going to meet outside. We'll be social distancing and wearing masks, but we'll be able to see each other, hear each other, and share once again the fellowship. Because being spiritual and religious means belonging to a community. And to belong to a community, you have to get together. So, if you uh, live in Wayne County and you've been finding value in our time together, I, enjoy, I invite you to join us next week. We'll be starting at 10 a.m. Our church is located at 1113 Southwest 6th Street in Fairfield, and you would be more than welcome to join us. Just bring your masks along. We'll have a seat for you, and uh, we'll be spending some time uh, discussing a Bible passage. And um, my talk will be live streamed just as usual, but I, in I invite you to join the community and go beyond just listening. In the meantime, be safe, my friends. Be prudent, but above all, look up. I'll see you next week.